everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our monthly Indigenous film series. I'm Jean Schumann from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and I will be your virtual host this evening. The Denver Museum of Nature and Science is pleased to partner with the International Institute for Indigenous Resource Management and the Denver American Indian Commission to present Indigenous film. As you watch the presentation tonight, please put your questions and comments in the chat, as you already have been doing. All of you are wonderful. Keep those coming. We'll be watching the chat throughout the event and we look forward to hearing everything that you have to say. So to begin tonight's event, I would like to introduce Jean Rubin, the Director of Indigenous Film and Arts Festival. Jean, take it away. Thank you. <clears throat> Welcome everyone to tonight's program. Uh, the screening tonight is a combined program, part of our annual Indigenous Film and Arts Festival and our monthly Indigenous Film Series. Uh, with me is Merv Tano. He's president of the International Institute for Indigenous Resource Management and also sits on the Denver American Indian Commission, uh, one of the co-sponsors. We have a lot of people to thank for making this program possible. We could not bring you the festival without the support of our uh, festival sponsors. You saw the logos scrolling on the screen when you were logging in. Um, I'd like to mention a couple of our major sponsors, the National Endowment for the Arts and Kanaka Minolta. And I also want to extend a special thank you to the Consulate General of Canada in Denver. They have been a longtime sponsor of the festival and their support helps us bring First Nations films from Canada into our program. We also have many community partners that support the festival. Uh, again, a special mention to Niuli'i Foundation and Kumulau Foundation who have helped get the word out um, to the Native Hawaiian community about uh, the program tonight. And as always, a special thank you to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. They do so much work, not just on screen, but behind the scenes to make these programs possible and helped us transition from what had been an in-theater program to these virtual programs uh, without missing a beat. So. Many thanks to them for making tonight's program possible. We have two short films in tonight's lineup. First is River of Small Gods from director Bradley Tonganen, and next The Shaman's Apprentice from director Zacharias Kunuk. And we are delighted to have Zacharias with us tonight. So following uh, the screening of the two films, we'll bring him on for an introduction and discussion and of course, you, uh, you can ask uh, questions as well. I want to just say, say a few words about tonight's program. At first blush, these films might seem to be very different. One is a live action film from Hawaii that the filmmaker describes as a modern myth. One is an animated stop action film uh, that tells a traditional Inuit story. But we paired them up because both of these films open a window into a spiritual world. And both, we think, will make you think. So with that, let's roll the films. The combined uh, runtime is 36 minutes. Uh, and then when we're done, we'll be back with Zacharias Kunuk. We're unmuted, right? Oh, I love those two films. Very powerful. Well, if we were in the theater, Zacharias would hear you all clapping. But since we're virtual, put your comments in the chat room and your, your clap emojis can go there too. It is really my sincere pleasure to introduce Zacharias Kunuk. He is a man of many accomplishments. I'm going to highlight just a very few of them. In 1985, Zacharias broke barriers at the Canada Council for the Arts when he was the first Indigenous applicant who was ruled to be eligible for a professional artist's grant. With that grant, he made an Inuktitut language uh, video called From Inuk Point of View. I'm going to skip ahead to 1990. Uh, he was one of four pa partners that founded Igluliki Suma Productions. This was a 
production company to produce independent video from an Inuit perspective. And over the next 10 years, a number of the Asuma artists helped establish an Inuit Media Arts Center, a youth media and circus group, and a women's collective for making video. In 2001, Zacharias directed his first feature film, Atanajua, The Fast Runner. I'm sure many of you have seen it. It's a fantastic film. It won the Camera Door Prize at Cannes. And in 2015, it was voted Canada's number one film of all time. And in my humble opinion, it, deserve, it deserves that credit. It's a terrific film. It was the first film that we screened and that was the film that um, got our whole festival kicked yeah, off. Absolutely. So we, we always feel indebted to uh, Zacharias and to Atanajua um, for giving us our start. Zacharias has directed more than 30 documentaries and feature films. We've had a number of them at our festival, uh, Inuit Knowledge and Climate Change, Maliglutta, One Day in the Life of Noah, <clears throat> of Noah the Yuzhatuk, uh, he was the executive producer of Edge of the Night, which we screened. Uh, just a tremendous body of work that he has. Among his honors, Zacharias was named an officer of the Order of Canada and an officer of the Order of Nunavut. So I know folks want to hear from you, Zacharias. I would like um, to ask you if you could start off our discussion by telling everyone how you got started as a filmmaker. What, what made you pick up the camera that first time? And what was it that you were hoping to accomplish? I was born on the land uh, in 1957, but I came to Igloo Lake in 1966 to be uh, schooled in English. I didn't know one word of English. Uh, I was nine years old. I was ready to be my father because it, my father would go dog taming out, hunting on the land. And I was just preparing myself to be like him. But I was sent to school, um, saddest day of my life. Uh, and I never left Igloo But when I got here, uh, there, were, there, there, were, there was this little community hall that we had. Um, that showed 16 millimeter films, uh, cowboys and Indians. Um, a lot of us, we were <laughs> too young to get it. So <laughs> we're not 16 yet. Um, so Saturdays we would go to children's TV and just entertain ourselves, just kill two hours entertaining ourselves. Um, but we, 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 when we watched these films and I watched movies with my fathers and his brothers who doesn't know one word of English and but they enjoyed the films and we didn't know there was such a camera or people so many people behind the camera um, so I've always been interested in watching films and I uh, wanted to be like a filmmaker so um, in 1981, as a sculptor, I was younger then. I flew down to Montreal and saw my carvings, my sculptures for camera, tripod, <laughs> TV, but there was no TV here in Igloo yet. Um, and because in 1975, <clears throat> the elders didn't want TV, 79, they, didn't, still didn't want TV, but as young guys, we were we wanted TV because it was all around us now in other communities. Um, but we gave in in 1983, uh, and here I was trying to film. That's how I got myself into this <laughs> into this mess. Uh, and I wanted to tell my. Uh, side of the story uh, because I've seen Southern filmmakers come up north and they would turn our igloo into a camp, uh, campground, uh, but that's not how we do it. We, we always wanted to show how we do it. And that's how I got involved doing 
filming and making a lot of mistakes, learning from my mistakes, and that's how I got here. Yeah, ter terrific. So, um, you know, I jumped right in with the first question without saying welcome to the program. I should tell the audience we've been we were chatting for a, a full 30 minutes before doing the, the technical checks and so I felt like I had already welcomed you, but welcome, belatedly welcome to the program. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, why uh, it was important for you to make uh, this particular film, The Shaman's Apprentice, why you wanted to um, delve into that subject matter. Um, the, the, the idea about talking about shamanism, supernatural world, uh, was banned when I came to Igloolik. Christianity came to Igloolik in 1921, somewhere there. Um, and then, because us Anglican sites and in the Igloolik, the there's Catholic sites, and we have a divided line. When I was growing up, I used to throw rocks at my cousins who are on the <laughs> Catholic side. Uh, so we grew up. Uh, like this, uh, and why I wanted to tell our, the story because my father and his hunting buddies would come home after a hunt and they would sit down at the table and drink tea and tell the hunt, they had a hunt today and I was just imagining what if we could capture it on film so we could see what they're talking about. And that's what also drove me uh, getting a camera in 1981 um, because I heard anybody can own a moving picture camera that I should own one because I'm interested in stealthography, uh, taking pictures. So I started filming um, first time here in Italy, in the Easter games and I'm out there, everybody, uh, I'm just filming and I've gone to school. Uh, so I know I'm reading the manual, but every time I play back, it's always black and white, even though my camera said color. Um, so I didn't figure that out like two months till I figured out it was just a switch, color balance switch. <laughs> so, that's how I learned my trial in the air. So I think um, the the Shaman's Apprentice um, was your first animated film, I believe. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what was challenging about that, and were there certain aspects of the story that were actually easier to tell through animation? Um, this story I heard. Uh, in back in 1980s, middle of 80s, about the shaman's apprentice. Um, and I wanted to do something all these years. And then we would always experiment in a uh, new, new style. And I've tried animation uh, with an Aboriginal company in Montreal, and it didn't turn out the way I wanted it. But this company, Takut Productions in uh, near next community, uh, our capital, Nunavut capital, uh, they do what I like. I've seen their work and I approached them and I told them the story and they, they really love this story. And so that's how, that was my second, second try. And I fell in love with Shemin's Apprentice right away. I see the character. Um, and I'm up here in the Canadian Arctic, 200 miles north of the Arctic Circle. And I'm working with people down in Toronto. Um, quite a challenge uh, because they don't know my culture. <laughs> they don't know how, what a dog team is uh, or a dog harness is. Um, so I had to show them. I had, I had to come down twice, uh, sometimes during to uh, uh, Toronto Film Festival, I would escape from there and go to the, the stop motion 
department where we were making this and show them more. So that's how we did it. And I had this composer in Montreal, uh, Northern Quebec, um, you know, uh, singer, uh, Beatrice Deer, who did fabulous drum dancing and throat singing in the, in the film. Um, yeah, that's how we did it. Yeah, the, the thrust, the thrust singing is lovely. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I, I I really like the, the the film Zacharias on 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 several levels. Uh, um, the 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 question I have for you uh, well, it's a series of questions. Uh, is uh, what uh, is uh, shamanism tra traditional healing? Uh, still part of the culture, uh, and uh, it, how is it being uh, uh, kind of uh, transferred, uh, developed? Uh, how is it? Uh, uh, are, are there now uh, uh, apprentices uh, uh, working with? Uh, uh, with 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 shaman. Uh... Um, shamanism in our culture was the religion, but when Europeans came and <laughs> they told us this is wrong, all wrong, and in our culture, um, yeah, it's been used as opposition, shamanism. So uh, as Anglican, it was totally banned to talk about it. When I was growing up, my parents never talked about it. They never sang traditional songs, only hymns from the Bible. Um, but the Catholic side, they did, they hang on to it more. But um, today uh, we can't, uh, we can't say there's shamans, but only shaman stories we know. Um, just uh, banned. Uh, parents listened and asked the next generation, <laughs> we don't have no clue, but we have a lot of problems with uh, people who ha have paranormal experience, like they have mental, now we call them mental because they hear somebody speaking to them. Um, but I don't know, I mean, it's, we're just starting to talk about shamanism now. Because that, I'm, I'm, I'm interested, especially as it relates to kind of, if you will, Western uh, medical practice, the, the extent to which uh, uh, so many of these uh, uh, medical practitioners, psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, the, uh, uh, MDs are all. Some of them are 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 looking to the past, to, to the culture, to the 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 kind of uh, uh, spiritual, the kind of emotional support that came from uh, traditional healing practices, and, and 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 seeing the relevance of those to uh, to modern day uh, issues that. Uh, uh, affect uh, uh, native peoples. Is, is that happening uh, where, where you are? Uh, not much, no, no, not much. Uh, people are still very religious. Uh, it's like <laughs> we're, my parents are preparing to die. They, they go to church, I mean, I mean, the shamanists, the shamanism part is uh, just the stories now. We're trying to learn them back. Uh, as in this film, um, the man breaks a taboo by not sharing the food because food is very important to us. It was like money to us. Food was in clothing. Um, so people were told to share what they have. Uh, but this man decided to um, eat 
the tongue which he loved uh, and just for himself and got sick from breaking a taboo. That, that's the story. Yeah. But what do we know? I mean, there's a lot more stories like this that has to appear. And shaman stories, helping spirit stories. Um, I heard about shaman, one shaman story. I heard about uh, shaman's comp competition. Um, and also when tobacco was introduced to Inuit, uh, of course we would run out for till the next ship comes. That would be a year. But I've heard of shamans that would gather around and they're, they're dying for smoke and then they're sitting there and then all of a sudden they're popping smoke. I mean, I, mean, I don't know. I don't know. These are shaman stories, but I don't know how, how they got it, but uh, little stories like that we're, we're uh, starting to collect and as a filmmaker, it could be a scene. Hmm. We had two questions related to language. One, um, somebody wanted to know if uh, the writing that they see behind you on your on your wall is the same language as as what was in the the credits in the, the film. And then somebody asked if you she would like to hear pronounce the the film title in Inuktitut. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly correct. Uh, these are the same. This is the language how syllables we call it. Um, there's also Roman numerals that uh, the, the Catholics use more English style. Um, the title of this film is uh, being taught to be a shaman. Uh, so I titled Shaman's Apprentice. Terrific. Um... Are, are young people, uh, are you seeing more young people get involved with, with filmmaking that, that, um, that tells Inuit stories? Um, yes, um, we get young people involved uh, because uh, older actors have to train new ones. Um, old cameramen have to train new cameramen. <laughs> uh, yes, we're always training on the job. That's what I love. Training on the job because you learn. Um, yeah, we're, we're always, we're always, yeah. We we have training. We have a lot of training, it's especially sometimes when we're on when we're shooting, because we have these sets, like the igloos and all these sets that we're not using for the night. But the actors would be in there singing and learning their lines for the next day. Uh, yeah, we're always learning, and we're also trying to uh, make this film authentic uh, because uh, 100 years from now, uh, people will study our films. So we like to try to do it right. Try to have the dark team and how they tie their camping gear on the sled. Um, so uh, we try to, to do it right um, because in our culture we watch and learn uh, like our father making the sled or driving the dog team calling out the dog's names and all these you learn as you see it and that's what we're trying to do with our films too. You know I, I always feel I love watching your films and I always feel it's a real privilege that I get to see them. But I also feel as though I'm not your primary audience. Because when I watch the films, yeah. it always seems to me that there's there's uh, spoken references and there's visual references. And there's certain things that people in the community understand that that I don't get the, the meaning. So could you talk a little bit about who who, you're, who are your audiences? Who are you primarily making these films for? Yeah, our first, our, our, our first audience are our people. Um, and once it passes through our people, and then we set it out to the world. Uh, and, and 
I've watched films. I've watched Kung Fu films that are dubbed into English. Um, I didn't want my film to look like that. It would be a bad uh, Kung Fu movie. Um, but I want my audience to hear our language, uh, subtitles to another language, could be any other language. So, so that's what we do. Somebody wanted to know if Hollywood, after, after uh, Atanajwa, did Hollywood come calling? Pardon? Did Hollywood, after, after the success of Atanajwa, were you approached by anyone in Hollywood about working uh, on a, you know, a big Hollywood production? <laughs> no, 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 I don't, I don't do that. I don't do that. I don't only do what I do. Oh, somebody uh, was asking if you could say um, a little bit more about throat singing and uh, she's, well, what is the proper name for the chanting? It's, is it actually throat singing the, the proper way to refer to that? Yeah, that's what we, we say, throat singing. Um, because in, in, in Inuit culture, uh, there's not too many instruments. Uh, the drum this is the, in, the instrument. And then a lot of people make sounds with their throats. Um, and not too many instruments besides the drum. Uh, all the instruments were uh, brought by Europeans, like the, what they, the accordion, the Jewish harp, we play a lot, were introduced by whalers. Uh, so yeah, just the drum is mainly, and other gadgets uh, to make sounds. Uh, like in Africa, they have this, they make this sound. Uh, we have it too, um, I don't know. It's how we got it, but we have it. We have it too. That make sounds. So that's all we have. What's uh, do you have any any projects uh, upcoming that you you'd like to talk about? Films coming out, films that you're working on. Um, right now, um, we're doing documentary uh, about um, all this mining going on and all these inquiries going on. Um, so we're making a documentary about that. Uh, it's called Duty to Consult um, Aboriginal People. Um, and also working, always working on another film that I want to make, a story of wrong husband, uh, which I'm developing. Uh, yeah, always trying to do something, something interesting. I was in this, it's a, it's a good story, it's a good film. Well. A good story in the hands of a good filmmaker is a good film. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Terrific. Uh, someone wants to know if you uh, if you're considering making a live action version of The Shaman's Apprentice. Um, no, no. I thought of uh, because children love this film. Um, because Shaman's Apprentice could be another another episode <laughs> or it could be a series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I haven't thought about that yet. Uh, I was doing something different. What's, uh, what's the best way for, for people in our audience to support your work? I know, um, I think uh, we, I don't over know. in the chat room, there's, a, there's your website that I think people can go uh, they want to make a donation. Yeah, just go to our website. Uh, it's a dossier or the videos we have. Uh, it's a TV. It's uh, right there. 
So what 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 in in addition to making a donation, or can pe people uh, stream? Do you have paid streaming, or can people buy DVDs? What are what are other ways that they might be able to support what you're doing? Um, we we have a distribution department uh, because we have to deal with the world um, based in Montreal, uh, so they do the deals. I I split myself to a talent site because it's a whole of a headache <laughs> financing financing films, <laughs> distribution, marketing. It's another way of working. I put myself on the talent side. I just try to make them. So distribution is handled by our Montreal office. Uh, you know, you, you talked about the duty of uh, consultation uh, in, with mining. Uh, what kind of uh, consultation do you guys do? Uh, with the community to ensure that uh, uh, the community has input into, if you will, the kind of uh, how the story is told, uh, 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 how props are created, et, et, et cetera. You know, so it doesn't end up like a, uh, uh, a, a translated Kung Fu uh, <laughs> a film. <laughs> well, when I'm after a story, like the shaman's apprentice, I would sit down with elders uh, like for a week to develop the story, uh, hear more stories. So, uh, in shaman's apprentice, I got stuck um, because when the tunnel opens to the underworld, um, I had this idea that they climbed down by a ladder. That was my southern way of thinking. Uh, but then in this world, there's no ladders. But then I thought maybe they had bone, human bone ladders. No, that's just a comic cartoon. Um, <laughs> so I went to an elder and um, told this elder, I'm stuck. I don't know how to solve this problem of how they climbed down. I mean, this, this old woman started laughing at me and asked me, how do you come climb down a hill? It's okay. <laughs> we'll climb down a hill. <laughs> so, so when they're climbing in the story, they, their, their bones are, they leave their bones and they go down to the underworld. And we try to show that. Thank you. Oh, uh, somebody is asking if your filmmaking is helping to keep the language vital among the younger generation. Uh, because there's so many different dialects in the Arctic. Um, in my area, we have this dialect and we have this style of clothes. Other Western Arctic, they have different style of clothes. Uh, yes, we are trying to preserve our language um, in my area um, because I don't like to mix dialects and uh, because elders know um, if an Inuk is far away or a southerner is far away and they're walking, they know the difference. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that's what I try to know too and try to uh, also my actors um, uh, very, I guess I'm typical. <laughs> I try to choose my actors. Or I look at their face, and they look like some of them nowadays. A lot of Inuit look like like a southern person. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, but they want to be Inuit too. So, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I should give them a chance to act, they want to act. How, how old were the, uh, the people who were, were um, speaking in the film? Uh, More or less. Uh, 
the Shaman's Apprentice voice is uh, voiced by Lucy Turugat, who played the, uh, the bad wife of the fast runner. And wow. the old woman's voice is Madeline Ivalu, who also acted in some other films that we do. Uh, uh, the, the man that comes in, opens the door is Jackie Kunduk. He's, uh, he's, he's at the uh, AXIC group, the, the art. Circus guys. Um, so he, here we are experimenting, just recording ourselves, and then a year later, it appears that that's stop motion animation. Um, someone was asking how they can see more of your work. I know so, there's there's some. Um, there's a lot that could be uh, seen on, on your website. Um, but mm -hmm. let me tell this, this person uh, to search for the Fast Runner because uh, that's available lots of places to, to, to rent, to buy the DVD. And that's, that's a must see, absolutely fabulous film. Fabulous story, I heard it when I was a child. <laughs> Never forgot the bad man running out there naked <laughs> on the ice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> reading, reading, reading about filming those scenes um, is really something. I think you have uh, you have a lot of information on the on the, the website about Atanajuat and um, filming where the the actor first they first gave him uh, like like uh, fake feet. So it wouldn't cut up his feet, and it, just, and it was cutting up. The ice was cutting the fake feet, and so he just took them off and basically let the ice cut up his actual feet. <laughs> was, I mean, um, he, he talks about, um, you know, that that Atanajoa was so, is so iconic in the culture that he just felt compelled to really put his heart and soul into into that role and. And be you know as close to Atanajuat as he could, falling naked into into icy water. It's um, it's a tremendous film, and it, there's a tremendous backstory to that film as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when actors uh, transform form themselves to the character they're playing, it's real. That's what we want. That's all we want. And yeah. the camera is just happy to roll. Yeah, that's what we train our actors how to get into a character because it's not you anymore. You're playing this person. And so they do a lot of research. What kind of person this person they're playing is? Is he uh, always sad or always happy or always angry? Uh, so they, they try to learn the character. And actors, most actors learn that. And that's all we want. That's all we want. And it looked more real this way. In Atanaljad, when they're crying, real tears are coming. It's fabulous. It's just what we want. It's a, it's a, it's a phenomenal film. Well, it looks like we have come up to the end of our time. I want to thank you again for for joining us and, and for sharing your thoughts i know we we tried i don't know if you remember i remember we tried in 2003 when we screened Antanajua and it was two days of travel and bad weather and it just wasn't possible so with the miracle of technology now it's great that um yeah. you can you can join us like this and we really appreciate uh, yeah. your time and your really do. sharing your insights and yeah. your experiences uh, I think COVID has brought us more cyberspace. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Thank all three of you. Thank you so much for this program. Are there any final comments before we close it out for the night? Thank you, DMNS, as always, for, for making this happen. And thanks to everyone in the audience who joined us. Wonderful. Yes, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. If you enjoyed tonight's program, I am going to throw a donation bucket link 
right into the chat there. Uh, so if you have the means and would like to support the Indigenous Film Series, go ahead and click that link. Uh, we appreciate all of you helping to make these films accessible to everybody. Thank you so much for joining tonight, and hopefully we will see you next month in May. There is no registration for that one. It will be live, so keep your ear to the ground on that one, and we hope to see you next month. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.